Welcome to Rascal Apiary, and today we're going to discuss how to become a beekeeper. And what we're going to use as one of our tools to guide you through the process of becoming a beekeeper is the North Carolina Master Beekeeper Program Certified Beekeeper Practical Examination. A link will be provided in the description to the North Carolina State Beekeepers Association. And you should go there, print it off, follow along with us. Let's get started. Okay, now that you've downloaded the paper, printed it out, and you're going to follow along with us, Let's go to section one. Section one, is the applicant properly dressed to manipulate a hive of bees? Let's get dressed. All right, we have Mike all dressed up, ready to get into a hive. As you'll see, he has his jacket with included veil, his bright orange gloves to protect his hands. He has his hive tool also, very important. He has long pants. So bees aren't going to sting him on his legs. And if he picks up his foot, you can see he's got closed toed shoes. Also very important. You don't want to get into a hive wearing sandals. So question two in section one, was the applicant able to light a smoker for the entirety of the inspection? So smoker, you're going to have to take one of these guys and light it and keep it lit. Let me tell you, puff, puff never meant so much to making it through the entire examination. So let me show you how to light it and let's go. Okay, today we're gonna demonstrate how to start your smoker up and keep it going for your inspection. Now, the first thing that you're gonna need, something to make a flame. You could use this. We have this as well. Matches work, so, however you wanna make fire. You're gonna need a smoker. And then in our bucket here, we have kindling. And that's just something small that burns pretty easy. And then we'll also add like a piece of pine or some other bark or wood to keep the flame going and smoke going. Typically we'll use pine, like pine needles in our smoker. That gets it started real fast. It's easy. Uh, to light those with anything. And then we'll put wood shavings or something on top of that to create the smoke. And untreated wood, the other tip is don't wear your plastic gloves while you're doing it. Occasionally I do, it's okay, just don't burn yourself because then you have plastic stuck to you. And veil taken off because you don't wanna burn a hole in the front of your veil as you're doing this. Smoker, if you bought a new one, brand new, pop it open, take out the disc that's in there, and the disc will have these legs. However, the legs sometimes are pushed in, so it's a nice flat round disc. You want the legs to be out like this, so it has something to rest on, okay? And then, of course, legs down. Make sure it's in there that way. And it is. And what we're gonna do is put some kindling in there. So we just reach to the middle of the, the bucket here and we'll fill, fill a little bit in there. And then I'm just gonna grab a small chunk of wood, put it in there. I'm gonna light my, my torch. The clicker sometimes doesn't work. That's why I was saying I'm may be embarrassing if I click it and it doesn't start a flame, so. Boom, there we go. So then, I'm just gonna stick it right in there and get that smoke going a little bit. You can put it on the ground and do it. It's a little bit better, because then the ashes don't come out at you but you gotta keep your lighter lit. Boom. That way your hand's out of the way. You're getting it nice and hot.
what you want to see is a flame. Once flames start coming out, give it little puffs. You'll start seeing more flames, good sign. What you want is high flames coming out of there, and then, then you would smother it with your kindling to make the smoke. So I'm gonna keep adding some more kindling a little bit at a time, get the flames going. Typically you wanna sit your body to the wind so that your smoke's not hitting you in the face. But for this video, the shot in the background was cool enough. I'm gonna sit here and let it hit me in the face every now and then. So just keep pumping it. If you have to light your smoker again, or uh, your lighter again to, to create more fire, if it burns out, you can do that. But typically I just pump it, wait for some flames and embers to come out. I could throw some hickory in there. A little bit more wood. And as you're going, just pump a little faster and faster until you start getting a flame. And then just smother it and you'll get a lot. So you wanna just keep pumping, get those flames nice and high. Hopefully you can capture that on the camera. Flames nice and high. Once you have that going, go ahead and take your, your kindling and put out your fire. There you go. I was missing the flame a little bit. Let me take that out. Stuff like this that comes off your table saw when you're cutting real small pieces, just crunch it up, put it in the top. And what you want to do is start puffing again on this thing. And the, uh, the smoke might go away for a little bit, but as you puff, it'll start, flames will start coming out again, and that's what you want. The more you pump, the more you're feeding that heat at the bottom, some oxygen, and the more smoke you're gonna get. If you're doing this practical, you wanna be almost obnoxious with it, okay? Try and make sure you prove the point that yes, I can create smoke as we're doing here. It's burning my eyes a little bit. Once you start burning your eyes a little bit, go ahead, take it. Close this thing up. Now on the practical, you can read. If you have to restart it a second time, that's okay. But a third time is a no-go. So now that it's closed, I give it a couple pumps, short pumps, and then longer pumps. So the short pumps are because they're still kindling in there and you'll see it try and come out because of the air that you're pushing in. If you do the short pumps, it comes up but not out the hole. It drops back in into a spot that's out of the way of the air. And then you can do big pumps and you're good to go. Make sure your cap is sealed properly. You might have some kindling on the outside because I just drop it all over. And then this will last you the entire inspection. The only thing that you have to do once you get to this point, if you're using smoke or not, for your practical, is walk over and give it just a couple pumps. You don't even have to point it at nothing, but just to keep that, that heat and oxygen flowing through your smoker. All it's doing is slowly burning kindling in there and it'll stay lit. Now, if you go five, 10 minutes and you don't pump this, it's gonna burn out. I mean, it just cools down way too quick. Just do one or two frames and then just come over and give it a little pump. One or two frames, come over, give it a little pump. If you're using it, then you're good. Another tip is if you're pumping it, you should be able to put your hand over it and get, get a feel for the heat that's coming out. It should be cool. You're not trying to blast your bees with hot air, okay? 
you're just trying to get cool air. Plus, smoking your hands, if you are not wearing gloves and you're trying to be brave and show that you can just use bare hands, which I give a thumbs up to that. I do it on occasion, depending on time of year, but smoking your hands will keep them from stinging you. It's not 100%. It's kind of like anything else in the world. It's just a technique that you can use to try and prevent being stung. Also, if you have been stung just once and you want to continue, go ahead and give your smoker a couple pumps with your hand or whatever the part is, like if it's a leg, smoke that. It masks the banana smell, which is the alarm pheromone that the bees put off whenever they sting. You can mask it. It's not going to prevent it completely, but it gives you an opportunity to continue your inspection. That's it. And the final question in section one is, can you open a hive box? Let's show you how to do that. Take off your weight, throw it on ground gently. Then if your hive top doesn't come off easily, it is because propolis in the inner cover have now connected it. What you're gonna do is take your hive tool and you're going to put it in between the box and the, uh, the top. And then what you're gonna do is use it as leverage and just pull until you hear that propolis crack. Once it cracks, then this will come off easily. And you can tell ours has been propolized because you can see the propolis all around the sides. This you can clean off, however, propolis has medicinal qualities, so we keep it. Now I'm gonna put the, the top cover behind the hive in a manner so that when I take the boxes off, I can lay them perpendicular on the top so that we're not crushing bees. Inner cover, you will put your hive tool in the cracks on the corners, lift, move on to the next corner, lift, and then on mine, if I get the back two, then I know I can lift and get the top off. Not a ton of bees. So moving on to section two, what we're gonna do is point out each of the hive components. Basically, everything that makes a hive box. Now, we at Rascal Apiary recommend do this entire section before getting into a hive. You don't wanna be in a hive with your bees out, you trying to do an inspection and do this practical at the same time with a certified beekeeper and it take more than 20 minutes for you to get through all the questions as you're inspecting. Just go through the things that you can go through that don't involve your bees prior to actually doing the inspection. That way you can get in there, you can focus on them, and your priority is not as much as practical as it is taking care of your bees. And that's the responsible thing to do. Let's get on to identifying hive components. All right, we're at the hive. You'll notice I'm not wearing protective gear like Mike. That's because I'm not going to be doing an inspection. I'm not going to open the bees at all. And I'm not in front of the hive in the bees flight path. I'm also not wearing any perfume or heavily scented shampoo. So we shouldn't have any problems. And if we do, we just calmly walk away. Let's get to it. Oh, you'll see our smoker still going. All right, and we'll start at the top. We have a center block on top. That's just to help weigh it down a little bit in case anybody comes and gives a little nudge. We have a telescoping outer cover and that's covered with metal and it comes down and hugs the box on the sides. Just underneath that is our inner cover and it has a hole on top for internal feeding. We also have a hog half comb, which is a type of super. We have a queen excluder you can see sticking out just here. That just keeps the, uh, the queen in the bottom brood chambers. We have a 
shallow brood chamber, and we also have a deep frame brood chamber. Underneath that, we have the bottom board. You'll see it extends all the way out here with a nice landing board and the entrance reducer. And you'll see the bees going in and out of that. And underneath that, this lovely heavy duty hive stand. So in section three, you're gonna see us actually open up a hive box and we have one that meets most of the requirements of this section, if not all of them. So what we'll do is we'll get in there, we'll find every piece, we'll point it out to you, we'll take pictures so you can see close-ups, and then if there's something that we can't cover, because not all hives are equal, we will find something that will cover that specific bullet point so you know what it is and you know how, how to identify it. Let's get to it. Our super, we look in from the top, but we're not expecting to see much. Like you should see honey. If you're getting to the point where it's capped honey, take a look, see if it's worth harvesting, if that's what you feel like doing. But we're not looking for a queen in here. All you should find are adult worker bees and drones if they can get past your queen excluder if you so choose to have one. Okay, the super, you don't have to place on the, the top cover. You can just place this on an edge off to the side. Okay. You're gonna do the same thing to get your excluder off. Just put your hive tool in there, run it along the edge, that'll free it up, and then you can take it off. I put it on top of the, uh, the super most of the time, but in this case, I'm just gonna put it on the inner cover on the front. I have the queen sitting on top. She's not moving. Actually a little worried about her now because why is she sitting on the top frame here? So I'm going to pick her up and the way you do that, make sure your gloves on nice and tight. Okay. You want to pick her up where your fingers form a U. Okay. And you want her head to be going into the web of your fingers. So right, right like this. So I'm going to pick her up. So her butt is the red part of the hive tool. Move the other bees slightly. And she is dead. But this is how you would pick her up. Just like that. Try not to squeeze. So I'm going to set her to the side. See if we can figure out what happened. These are shallow frames. You can tell because the palm of your hands can basically go from the top to the bottom. Even a child's hand could pretty much do this. Um, they're, the pros are they're lighter, so that if you have back problems, they're easier to lift once they're full of honey. However, they're the same length as your deeps. So they will fit in a uh, extractor easily. How to requeen your hive? Well, this is one way. We're gonna have the bees do it. And I'm gonna ensure that they have eggs and larva. And if they have an abundance of it, I'm gonna let them do their thing and make some super seizure cells and then I will I will decide if I'm going to split this into a bunch of little nukes or 
if I'm going to sell queens or what I want to do. Okay, so my wife just pointed out adult worker bee and a drone. Now, adult worker bees have many different jobs throughout their lifetime. That is covered in a different video that we did, I believe a slow-mo Monday. So if you'd like to take a re relaxing trip and watch some bees, put them on the screen. You can listen to them. My son makes the music for it. And I put informational notes, facts on bees so that you can watch and still learn something. It looks like even though this was a, a brood chamber, that's what we had decided as beekeepers, that they were going to have two brood chambers. And they had decided to treat it as a honey super, which kind of makes sense because this is a 10 frame hive and in this area because we talked to local beekeepers they run one 10 frame box with supers on top because there's enough frames for the queen to do her thing and make make a brood chamber so that being said all of these frames appear to be honey honey and nectar no pollen at all and all you want to do is, as you're being a beginner, you're going to make mistakes like killing your queen on accident, which we can't prove that I did that. <laughs> she might have just had a heart attack when she saw me. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's good to stay nice and slow, even pace, but not so slow you're in the hive for over 20 minutes. We'll try and keep this part of the video less than 10. We just want to get in, see what we can see. If we see what we like, then we get out. Um, if we see what we don't like, like a dead queen, then we got to kind of investigate more. But the key is not to get too frustrated with yourself or the others around you that are trying to help you um, because everything is fixable. You just got to step back and think about it we watched a video the other day of a guy who tried a new technique on all of his hives and he ended up killing them in two weeks. That's going to happen. My advice is don't, don't, don't do something new to all your hives. That's why you have two. Do something new to one and then recover. Here we're going to have a, adult bees. These are girls. And then we'll have drones walking around right here. This is a drone. So a drone does not have a stinger and all he does is reproduce. Typically he doesn't even feed himself. He will, uh, he'll go through the, the hive and beg the girls to feed him and then uh, they'll feed him. Let's see. This is why I like the J hook because this hive in particular, not all hives do this. And not all hives are the same. This one specifically propolizes everything that it possibly can all the time. It makes my life a little rough because I try and move nice and smooth. And the propolis sometimes wants to hold on for dear life. So what I do here is I put my back to the sun and I look at my frame of mainly all male bees. Something that you should look for is the size of the cell. If you look at these size, uh, they're bigger than looking over here at this size. That's a little smaller. The other thing you're looking for is remember when I said put the frame up a little higher and scan the bottom. We have a queen cup here and here. The reason that they're still cups are because they're not capped over and there's nothing. Well, I got to check, but oh, in here I have bee bread. That is a nectar and pollen mixture that the bees do. Now you can hear that they're getting louder. Um, that is because they're all drones. And when drones start moving around and buzzing around, they get real loud. They also like to crawl all over your hands and everything else. They're kind of funny little guys. But 
I'm going to continue to look for eggs. I put my back to the sun and I, I look down into each of the, um, the cells. And that has nothing but a bunch of drones and a couple workers. Okay, now that I got one frame out of the way, I put it on my frame rest. It's easier to maneuver in the hive. I do my search pattern for my bees. I find more cups. I do a, a book method to flip the, the frame over. I'll do it again so the camera can see. Let me finish my, my pattern. But this is all it is. Hold it like this, flip like that, boom. That way your wax doesn't fall out of your frame because this is a uh, foundationless frame. So I'm doing, I'm doing an extra careful job looking for any eggs because the queen's sitting right there uh, motionless. And typically at this point, I would have seen the queen alive walking around and I would have just gone ahead and closed it back up. There's no reason to go through the bottom box if you already found your queen. However, I need to find some eggs. Oh, there's larva in this one and lots of it make sure there's not a second queen walking around in here but larva as well and these are the small ones that you would graft so grafting is a little bit more uh, advanced for a beginner beekeeper, but what you're looking for there is not, ex not a larva, but an egg that's starting to curl into a C. That's the best way I can describe it for you without showing a picture. But if you do know somebody that is currently grafting and you say, hey, my hive's having troubles, can you come and graft some queens for me? If they're good friends, they'll do it for free. So here we're showing you a queen cup. And remember queen cup is when it is not filled or capped. There's absolutely nothing in that one. So it's just on standby. It's, it's on standby for when the queen decides, hey, I'm getting old, and the workers start pestering her, saying, hey, you're old, and everybody kind of agrees, like, hey, lay in this cell, and you'll be on your way. So if that's death or swarming, it is what it is. So. Haven't found a second queen or any sort of What is going on there? Oh. Any sort of indications that there would be? I see a ton of uh, drones, which are male bees. And in that case, it could be an indication of swarming. However, since I have the queen sitting right there, she's not swarming anytime soon. And all the queen cups are not filled. So I can go ahead and say that that's less likely. But we are in luck because I just requeened, or uh, I just pulled a queen from a different hive, and I might just combine this one with that little nuke, or combine the nuke with this hive, because there's plenty of bees. So we'll just try and uh, get them to like the new queen by using that newspaper method. And we'll talk about that coming up next. Basically gone through every frame because the last one's actually completely empty. So I'll, I'll finish this one and then we'll close it up and Lisa and I will go 
take a break and discuss what we want to do because we're a team. And that that's empty. Okay. So we got we got a bunch of bees and they now have no queen. But we did have a couple frames with lots of larva on it. I just use my hive tool to get that that frame moving because sometimes a propolis it's very very tough to move all your frames over a little bit more on the plus side they give me a guide because where I see it stacked up is where the frame was <laughs> We'll see if we can stick this one in. Do I have enough room? Yeah. So. Okay. Then you got your last frame in, right? But you're not done because you need to then push it up against the rest of the frames. And then you also need to Go to the other side and make sure both sides are evenly spaced. So when you look at the hive, you go space on the outside, space on the outside. Done. Then I just pick up the next, next box, stick it on here. Whoops, get out of there. Try and be friendly to the bees as much as possible. Well, I'm going to put the queen excluder. Nah, I won't. You're right. So, so because no queen, that kind of tells us they have nothing but bees now. They just have to focus on making a queen and then they'll they'll have this kind of downtime where all they really all they're really going to do is bring nectar into the hive. So I want to make sure they have some room to build wax and I want to make sure that as they build wax they don't instantly fill it with nectar and then when the new queen comes she has no place to lay. So she'll go on a mating flight, come back, and if she still has no place to lay we're in trouble. I give them a little bit of extra space and then the next time I come in we'll take a look and see how they're doing and hopefully we'll we'll have some signs of queen cells and then maybe i'll make some more hives remember to put your inner cover back on and then before i put my top on i take a look around because we have some other things that we put in the hives sometimes that get left out um, beetle blaster is one of them uh, brood minder sometimes depending on the hive so I just look for things that are lying around like queen excluder. I wouldn't want to put the whole thing together without putting one in. Now queen excluders are a subject for discussion. Discuss with me in the comments. I know that not everybody uses them. I only use them until they start making the super the super and then I take it out so they can fill the whole thing. But that's one person's plan. You don't have to follow it. Put that on. Put our weight back on. Prove that our smoker's still going. It's going pretty good. So we're done. Let's move on to the next section. Miscellaneous questions, section four. Now, your hive box should be sealed up at this point. If you're still in there, and the proctor is trying to ask you questions that you know to be in this section, miscellaneous questions, just ask them to pause and seal up your hive. Go somewhere where it's nice and cool because here in North Carolina, it can be hot. And what you may want to consider is maybe some switchel or some honey pecan apple cake. You can find those recipes on Apiary Eats. That's a shameless plug. So now that you're at these questions, how do you answer them? We're going to go step by step and give you a reasonable answer to pass this test. Question one is what kind of slope should the hive have? 
It's talking about the bottom board and why should it be sloped this way. Now when you set up a hive, common practice is you put some sticks or some sort of shim behind the back of your bottom board. That way it lifts up the back of the bottom board a little bit and it gives you about three degrees lift, three to five. Um, and that is so if there's condensation in a hive, it drips down and runs out the front. Now, if you have a screen bottom board, does that make sense? Not really, because it's going to go through the screen and then it goes into the ground. But if you have a solid bottom board, which is what we run at Rascal Apiary, it's going to hit the bottom board and then you don't want it just sitting there because then it will rot out your wood. You want it to slope forward and run out of the hive. Um, typically, if you do have condensation in your hive, uh, it's kind of a sign that something could be wrong, but that's something that you and your area will have to look at and figure it out, really. Here, I know that if there's condensation in there, it's because the bees have found another entrance or the wood has warped a little bit and rain's getting in, and then it needs to drain out the front. And then I just go put some blue painter's tape over that hole uh, and then let the bees propolize it, and we're good. Problem solved. The next question is, which way should your hive be facing and why? So south-southeast is what we do here. However, the textbook answer is south-facing slope and protected from prevailing winds. Now that's coming from the Beekeeper's Bible, reliable source. It's a book. It's not Wikipedia. Um, but we do southeast facing because the way that the winds uh, blow here predominantly are from the northwest. So if we're facing southeast, we're protected. Does that make sense? Okay. So the next question is, number three, is this hive prepared for overwintering? Now, I can't give you the answer to that because I'm not standing at the hive that you're inspecting or did inspect. However, what you're looking for for an overwintering hive is an abundance of brood and an abundance of honey because what you want is that queen should be laying, you know, winter bees, which predominantly live longer than summer bees or spring bees, and you want them to be able to eat something over winter because they don't come out of the hive and get nectar, at least in North Carolina. They do a little bit during the winter, but as you get further north, they're just not. They're going to cluster and stay in that hive as long as possible, eating their stores and protecting their brood. So what what you're looking for is brood and honey. Now, if your brood is split up in the hive and your honey is still on top, but your brood is not condensed to the middle of the hive, then you could have an issue as well. And you could run into a problem with your proctor asking you that question. So make sure that those frames that are on the outside that have brood are swapped out with resource frames that were in the middle. Because what the bees are doing is they start out with brood in the middle and then they expand, right? Well, when those the brood in the middle emerge, then they start filling it with resources. All you gotta do is pick them up and swap them to the outside. Now, don't do this if it's spring. Well, don't do it if it's summer. Just tell your proctor, no, they're not ready, but this is an explanation on how they would be ready and what I would do if necessary. So that answers that. Question four. Does this hive have adequate food storage for this time of year? And what you're looking for as a beekeeper is brood and resource frames. So when you're looking at your brood frame, don't count the resources on that frame. Just go, this is a brood frame. It has eggs, larvae, and capped brood. Now what you want is another frame that has resources. And in that, that frame would be bee bread, nectar and honey. Pollen is your other resource as well. Bee bread's really is what's feeding your brood. So you want a one-to-one -one ratio there where you have, you know, one brood frame and one resource frame. So it, the way that we look at our boxes is we have a brood box. As we're inspecting it, if we go, okay, the center three or four frames are all brood and then the outside frames are resources and then we have a super on top and there's also honey in there we're happy because 
that means an average of one to one is happening. If we get more resources than brood, we're looking good and we're happy with that. So that should be your answer. If it's not a one to one, the answer is no. And be honest, it's okay as long as you understand what's going on. So question five relates heavily to question four. Does it have enough food storage? Storage, yes. But is the hive preparing to swarm is the second part of five. So what are the indicators just looking at food storage because that's kind of what the question's asking. Now, if you start to see your brood pattern dwindle and honey storage increase. So let's say you have a super on there, that thing's full. And then you go into your brood box and you notice that last time you had two frames of resources or four frames of resources, but now you have five or six frames of resources and only a couple frames of brood. That's going to be a giant indicator that they are backfilling everything and they're going to swarm soon. Now you start taking out those frames and looking at them, you're looking for swarm cells, which are at the bottom of your frame. If you look at the last video that we posted or two videos ago, we talked about tips for beginner beekeepers. And one of the things was lifting your hive, looking around, and then lifting a little bit higher and scanning the bottom for swarm cells. Now, if you have those cells in there in the middle of the frame, that's a different story. But swarm cells on the bottom, kind of along the sides a little bit, those are swarm cells. They're getting ready to swarm. Um, it's something you should look for. Don't freak out about it. You can make many, many hives off of swarm cells. So if you're only expecting two hives this year and now you have swarm cells, congrats. You can have four or five or you can sell those cells to a beekeeper that needs a queen. And at some point, we'll put out a video on how to do that. Number six is if this hive were short on food, what would you do to correct the situation? And there's a lot of resources out there that tell you you must do this or definitely don't do this. We're going to give you the advice of a beginner beekeeper that only has two hives and it's your responsibility to keep them alive. And it's my responsibility to let you know how so that there's no emotional event that happens later with tears, lots of tears, and you seeing your bees starve. It is really cute looking at their bee butts sticking out of the cell, but then you realize it's kind of your fault that they died. Um, so the answer, one-to-one -one sugar water during the spring and summer, that's what you're going to feed them. You just mix one part water, one part sugar, mix it together, and then feed your bees. Uh, the next thing that you could do if you have, let's say, you know, a hive that's doing really, really well and one that's not doing well at all, if you still can maintain your one-to-one -one brood stores ratio and still take some out of your good hive, take some of the, the resource frames out of there, maybe one or two, knock off the bees, put it in the, the hive that's not doing that well, and give them a chance. Um, you know, anything's better than nothing when it comes to intervening to try and help your bees. And other things that you could do um, is put a pollen patty on. Don't put the whole patty. They sell it individually um, in packs, but really in North Carolina here, chop it up into little pieces, put you know one sliver in, let them eat it, check back in a little bit, put another sliver in. Uh, I would give them you know, four days in between, maybe a week in some cases, to eat that sliver of pollen patty. If you put the whole patty in because you're like, I'm not going to be here for two weeks, then the hive beetles will start eating and procreating in there. And then now you not only have a weak hive, but now you have a hive beetle infestation. And that is just decimating to a hive that's weak. Um, and that answers that question. If you have any comments about what you should do, please hit us up in the comments. There's a lot of different techniques out there, but this is what we recommend to people with two hives that want to survive. Number seven is how would you combine this colony of bees with another colony of bees? So that we have to understand the situation. If 
you are combining colonies, that means something has gone wrong in one of them. We're not talking about disease or pests. We're talking about you've lost a queen, um, you found laying workers in there, which is another loss for a queen. Um, there's a lot of different weirdnesses that can happen with bees between inspections and you show up and you're like, what is happening? Uh, sometimes you have to kill a queen because it is just creating the most defensive bees and you don't want to have to deal with that. So what you're going to do is you're going to pop off the top of your hive that's healthy and that you want to have these other bees join. Take the top off, take the inner cover off, lay a newspaper down. Now this newspaper you get at the store, you can get from uh, your neighbor that still gets the newspaper delivered. Borrow it, ask, and um, lay one sheet on top. Uh, and then what you need to do is mix some sugar syrup. So that's one part sugar, one part water. Mix it together, put it in a mason jar that has a lid that you can see holes in, called a feeder, feeder lid, or spray bottle. That's a common thing, go down to the dollar store, or whatever the cheap store is near you, and pick up a spray bottle. Uh, fill that with sugar water. You're gonna spray this newspaper, not soak it, but just get it wet. And spray it, get it wet. Now it's wet with sugar water, okay? And then you're going to take the hive of bees that are not doing so well, and you're gonna put it on top of that newspaper. So now you have the bottom box or boxes is a healthy hive, good to go with the queen. Then you have a layer of newspaper that's wet with sugar water, and then you're gonna have your box that's not so, so healthy or with a queen on top of that. And what's gonna happen is they are actually gonna chew and eat at that newspaper as they get the, like, taking the sugar and the water. During that time, they are going to be smelling the other hive, and we're talking about the top box, they're gonna be smelling the other hive and getting used to the smell of that queen and becoming familiar. That way, if you put that box on with no newspaper, they just go down and hunt for the queen. The bottom box will then defend the queen. You have World War B in there, and it's bad news. It's bad news for everybody. So your kid's coming around the hive or you're coming around the hive, they will be angry. So put the newspaper, if you are really concerned because they're big eaters, put two sheets, douse the, the newspaper with water, put your other hive on, they'll eat through it, it gives them a day or two, they put these little holes in it and they'll start sticking their head through and then eventually they'll make it through. Now if you wait a week or two, um, you'll be able to do an inspection, take the newspaper out, they should be good. Um, they, they won't have decimated your, your good hive in there. They will have mixed well. And then what you want to do is make sure you then sort the boxes so that you have brood on the bottom, resources on the top. And sometimes that means moving around frames. But for the most part, the bees will figure that out for you by the time you get to that inspection. So question eight is describe how you would requeen the colony you just inspected. And a lot of techniques out there. I'm talking a lot of techniques for requeening. But what are we trying to do? You gotta understand that you have to get rid of the queen that's already in there if she hasn't already bit the dust some other way. So that might mean pinching and placing under a flower and having a little burial ceremony. Um, that's, that's one option. And then the bees, within probably an hour or two, will know, hey, we don't have a queen anymore, let's start making a new one. And all they're gonna do is pick a couple of eggs that are good to go. They're going to start feeding it differently than they with royal jelly and an abundance of nutrition. And that's gonna pull out your little peanut shape um, supersedure cell. Sometimes they'll, they'll be on the bottom like swarm cells as well, but this is because you have forced them now to make a new queen. Um, that's how you, that's one way to replace it. A new queen will emerge. They'll all fight on the inside maybe some swarming, probably not. Um, that's one option as a beginner beekeeper. Second option would be to call the queen and then go to a beekeeping buddy of yours or your association or store and buy a new queen. And what you would do is kind of like how you did when you first got your swarm. If you 
dumped your swarm into a box and then hung the queen in her box inside there so that the entire colony could smell her and get used to her. Same sort of idea. You're going to put her in a little box, hang her in the hive, let the colony get used to her, and then now you have a new queen. Um, a couple days later, three, you'll have to come and let her out if she hasn't chewed her way out. But that's uh, for a different video. This is just how you requeen. So that, that's two steps right there. Both answers are acceptable, so good luck. Question nine is if your hive was being robbed, how would you stop the robbing? And straight answer, you have a robbing screen, install the robbing screen, done. That should give you a pass on this. Um, another way, if you're a beginner beekeeper and you're like, what's a robbing screen? Just get a bed sheet or some sort of sheet that's bigger that can cover the whole hive um, and just drape it across the front. Now, your bees will find a way into the hive. The other bees you'll see just hit the front and they'll just crawl around the front of that, uh, that curtain or blanket or whatever it is that you put there. Um, that's another technique that you could use. There's a lot out there. So, a simple Google search will give you all different kind of ideas, um, DIY builds on robber screens. What I would suggest is learn what a robber screen does, understand the dynamic and what it's preventing, and then build your own. That's what we do here so you don't spend all your money your first year on all new equipment. might look great, but some of that stuff becomes very pricey as you start out with two hives and then next year you have four hives then you have eight hives and so on and so forth and you're sitting like us at 20 hives going okay now we have to put them off property uh, and I'm not buying robbing screens for all of them. Question 10 is what method would you use to harvest honey from this hive for extracting? Now this is the part that beginner beekeepers are like, yeah, this is the exciting part, that 10% of beekeeping that's more fun than fun, and that's extracting. So depending on what kind of frames you have, if you have Langstroth frames, you can just have an extractor like you may or may not see behind me here. Can't see it? Okay. So that you can't see, but basically it's a barrel, and you put your frames in it, and you crank that thing and it will throw the honey out of the frame and most of the time keep your wax pretty intact so you can just stick them right back in the hive and those honeycomb look good. That's one way. Another way is cut comb honey where you're taking your frame out and you say I don't have an extractor I'm gonna use a knife. You cut that out, boom, stick it in a box or a, um, a box, plastic box preferably, and sell it that way and People just use a regular knife and put it on warm toast, let it melt, and eat the honey that way. Um, another way is chunk honey. That's basically you're pouring honey into a jar and then you stick your, your cutout comb in there. It's pretty cool looking. Um, those are just a couple of ways of extracting. Um, and you might be asking, well, how do I get the honey to pour into the jar? What you're doing is you're cutting your your wax off of your frame and then you're going to squeeze it and filter it so you can squeeze with your hand or whatever but it will then go into a strainer and then go into your your mason jar or honey jar and then you just cut out a little chunk of honey and you drop it in there it's fun people love it because kids are like honey wax the hive is inside my bottle it's awesome um, but there's a lot of different ways to extract if you have a war a or a top bar hive, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. The extractor won't work for you, which is the big uh, uh, barrel that you turn. You're going to have to do cuts and squeezes. Um, that's really the only way. There's a lot of cutting with top bar and war a kind of hives. So depending on what you're inspecting, research, get the answer that, that you like, but typically the satisfaction factory answer is I'm going to stick my hive or my frames into an extractor and I'm going to spin it. Now that we've been through every step of this practical, what happens next? Well, in section five, your instructor will fill out their evaluation. 
typically they say something nice about you and they say pass because that's what you want and that's what they want. They want more beekeepers. So they're going to give it to their instructional coordinator or educational coordinator, depending on what the title is in your state. And they will then pass it on to the state association who will then send you a certificate so that you can put it on your wall. In the background are our two certificates saying that we are certified beekeepers and now you can call yourself a beekeeper. So, congrats. Leave us a comment, hit a like, subscribe, hit notifications. Let us know if this helped you. Let us know if your state has some questions that were not covered here that you really need answered. We will do our best to help you. And maybe we'll make another video that's on like Georgia certified examination or EAS. If you you don't know what that is, Google it. It's a cool little association. Not little, it's big. Um, but it's traveling once, so maybe it'll come close to your home and you can go meet some really important people um, in the beekeeping world. So that's all I got for you. Have a great day.